Welcome back. I hope you had a chance to think about DBS and you're okay with the basic principles. And I hope you had a chance to get a new cup of tea. I certainly did. So with that, we're ready to talk about hyphenated techniques. Hyphenated because uh, that's how we write it, isn't it? DVS hyphen NIR in this case. I'm not actually sure that hyphenated is the right word, but it's the word that is uh, most commonly used. I think combined is quite a good word. So DVS combined with NIR would be a, a good option. But nonetheless, um, quite often they're called hyphenated techniques. So let's stick with that. So we're going to start with DVS and NIR. So NIR is near infrared spectroscopy. And it's an important technique because it's a laser based system and it's a reflectant spectroscopy. And that's kind of important in this case. So if you think about it, your sample is sitting in a pan in the DVS instrument. If we want to make a measurement of the spectrum of that sample as it interacts with a particular light source, then something like UV light is going to be no good because it's got to go through the sample. It's a transmittance spectrometry and it won't come out the other side. It's not very useful. NIR, on the other hand, because it's laser based, is reflective and therefore we can aim the laser at the material, but the laser is reflected back. And so we can then use a detector that's not getting in the way of the DVS measurement. So many years ago, we actually had a go at building our own combined instrument, DVS NIR. It was built by one of the postdocs in the school about 20 years ago. And it's um, still going strong. It is actually used by students quite frequently because it's kind of important to get extra information out of your sample if you can. The only change that we had to make to the instrument is you want the spectrometer to be able to shine the laser on the sample and it reflect back again. That won't work in a standard aluminium pan because obviously the laser will just bounce off the aluminium. So we just record the spectrum of aluminium all the time. So it has a special pan. It's made of quartz, the same as um, the same as some of the cells for UV spectrometers, actually. And it's a flat bottomed pan because you don't want a situation where the laser shines at the sample. And then because the pan is curved, it bends the light. You want the pan to be flat. So the laser goes straight through, interacts with the sample and comes back down again. So that's how the system is set up. You can always tell which one of the DVS instruments is linked to the NIR because it's got a flat bottom pan. The other ones have either round bottom pans or um, aluminium pan holders. Right? The NIR itself laser based, so it just connects to the instrument with a fiber optic cable. So on the screen is a photograph of the actual instrument that's in the lab upstairs. The black section in the center is the actual uh, is the DVS instrument itself. The balance mechanism is in that dome at the top. The two glass chambers down either side are the chambers in which the humidity is being controlled. And then the black cable, which is sneaking away from the bottom of the left hand side, uh, is the fiber optic cable, which is carrying the NIR uh, laser. And then the spectrometer itself is mounted on top of the instrument. This is just a close up picture of the pan itself uh, and the attachment for the NIR below. So you can see the NIR probe coming in the bottom and you can see the flat bottom quartz pan in which the sample is placed at the top. And when you want to make a measurement, those are brought together so that the NIR probe is just underneath the bottom of the quartz pan. So how do we use this particular setup and what sort of information can we get from it? So on the screen in front of you are some data recorded by one of my PhD students from uh, a few years ago, and it shows a sample that she had made and it is going through a wetting and drying cycle in the DVS. So the sample mass is plotted in red. The relative humidity that she is programming is plotted in blue. OK, so I hope you can see that if you look at the relative humidity profile, it starts at zero and then it goes up to 75 percent, back to zero, 75 percent and then back to zero. So it's wet, dry, wet, dry. If you look at the red, which is the mass change, you can see that initially there was a bit of water in the sample as it was held under a zero percent humidity, so a dry atmosphere. It loses that water and it reaches a position of equilibrium. So the mass comes down, stabilizes out. And then as the humidity switches to 75 percent, there's an increase in sample mass, which reaches a plateau, a decrease, increase, decrease. So quite a characteristic response from the sample. 
And the question is, what is happening to the water? Can we see what the water is doing with the sample at any point? So there are five black circles on that graph. Two of them are in the 0% humidity range. That's the two on the left-hand side. And then you can see three further black circles on the uh, wetting, the first wetting phase. One on the uh, increase and then two as you get towards the top of the plateau. So those five circles represent five points at which she recorded an NIR spectrum for the sample. Remember, those spectra are recorded while the sample is sitting in the DVS itself. So if you look at the NIR spectra, NIR spectra can be, they're quite difficult to interpret. There's, they're not quite as clear as, um, as infrared or UV actually. So they can be a little bit tricky and normally you plot the second derivative. So on the Y axis, the second derivative of absorbance, uh, X axis as usual is um, wavelength in centimeters to the minus one. And water has a quite characteristic absorbance around about 1875 centimeters to the minus one. And if you look here, that's where the arrow is shown. When the water is um, not there because the material is dry, there's not much absorbance at 1875 because there's not a lot of water in the sample to absorb in the first place. But as the material starts to get wet, you can see that the peak at 1875 is starting to increase. The blue line is the first of those three dots in the 75% humidity section. The pink is the second and the green is the third. And you can see that they are getting um, successfully, successfully, su successively higher because the amount of water is increasing in the sample each time. So it allows you to confirm that there's water interacting with your sample. And it also allows you to confirm that the amount of water is increasing, which is what you'd expect from the mass data. So you may well use that technique for some of your own samples as, as you go and start your project work later in the term. And that's really it for DVS. It's, it's a very simple technique. It's just measuring the mass of the sample as a function of humidity. And there's very little that can happen to your sample, pharmaceutical sample. It's really just going to absorb water it's going to absorb or adsorb water and there's going to be a mass increase. And in the, at least in the case of amorphous materials, there may be a crystallization event. And that's usually indicated by a mass loss. But that's it for a DVS interpretation. And it's possible to mix it with NAR spectra just to convince yourself where the water is. But really, that's as far as we go with um, DVS. A pretty simple technique, not, not too much to worry about. So I thought we'd finish the lecture by looking at how we might hyphenate other techniques. And the one that we tend to do a lot is DSC. Partly that's because I am a calorimetrist by training, so I like DSC in the first place. And partly it's because it's the sort of technique that lends itself very well to being linked to other techniques, as, as we will show you. Okay. Now remember, the main use for DSC is physical form determination. It's looking at phase changes as a function of temperature. It's a really good technique because it doesn't really matter what the phase change is. The chances are there's going to be a change uh, in the DSC baseline, either an exotherm or an endotherm. So it's really good for identifying what phase transitions there are. It's a little harder to say unequivocally what each phase change corresponds to, because either it's an exotherm or an endotherm. That's it, isn't it? It's very difficult to start to probe any further than that and go, well, this is definitely the change from form one to form two or something like that. It's much harder to say that because there's no molecular information in calorimetric data. And so if you only have DV, uh, DSC data and you're interpreting them by saying, well, I think this is crystallization or I think this is melting, it's a little bit ambiguous. It's about you asserting that that's what's happening in the sample, but it's no evidence that's what's actually happening. So this is a problem we came across many years ago and we thought to ourselves, how best to deal with this? And we thought, well, as we have the DVS linked to a spectrometer, perhaps it would be a good idea to link the DSC to a spectrometer as well. And that's what we did. Now, I've got to be fair, we didn't do this ourselves with our own DSC because we didn't have a spectrometer that we could mount above the DSC itself. So it happens that my friend at the University of Bradford does have a Raman spectrometer that he can mount above his DSC. And so we sent our samples to him. So the examples I'm going to show you are from his laboratory. So we could have used NIR, but we used Raman instead, principally because he had a Raman spectrometer. That's the main reason. Uh, but also Raman is a little bit more uh, useful for 
chemical interpretation. You can identify what your active is from its Raman spectrum. But more importantly, if the polymorph of your material changes, usually that occurs with a change in Raman spectrum as well. So Raman spectra tell you both the chemistry of the material, but also the physical form of the material. And that's kind of important, isn't it? Because the, the DSC is looking at physical form changes. You know what the, the chemistry is. Secondly, the Raman is also a laser based system. And so it's reflective, exactly the same as the NIR. So in this case, the setup is kind of ideal for a DSC. You put your sample into an aluminium pan and then you don't put a lid on. So the pan is kept open and the laser can shine onto the sample and then it's reflected back to the detector. So that's kind of useful. No? So on the screen is a photograph of the actual setup which my friend has at uh, Bradford University. On the left is the DSC itself and the Raman spectrometer. So the entire Raman um, probe is the black box being clamped on the left hand side and it's sending the data back to the computer via that cable you can see on the top and then the DSC itself is that silver disc um, on the top of the instrument all we've had to do is make sure that the furnace cover is out of the way so the furnace cover is at the back we can't have the furnace cover over the sample because then there's no way of getting the spectrometer probe to go over your sample so the furnace cover is removed and instead you have the um, Raman spectrometer in this case mounted directly above the sample pan. If you were to look down at the sample pan from above, you can see a sample and a reference position. That's where those two black circles are on the image on the right hand side. And we just make sure that the laser itself is aimed over the sample side. OK, and we don't put a lid onto the pan because if we did, we're just going to measure the spectrum from aluminium, which would not be good. So I'm going to give you an example of a material that we tried to characterize this way. And so it is a co-crystal. You probably know what co-crystals are from the 0032 series. There's a, a lecture on um, pseudo polymorphs and co-crystals are in that lecture, I think. So it's a co-crystal of benzoic acid and isonicotinamide. And if you remember from the pseudo polymorphs lecture, co-crystals can form in a number of different ratios. So in this case, we can have a two to one ratio of benzoic acid and isonicotinamide and we can also have um, a one-to-one -one. and if you put those two materials into a DSC they behave differently. You might reasonably say to me while well, looking at the set of DSC data Simon I can see two sets of data here for two-to-one benzoic acid and isonicotinamide one with water and one says TIJP. What's TIJP? So the answer is we had a PhD student at the time who was looking at whether it was possible to use thermal inkjet printing to print co-crystals. So TIJP stands for thermal inkjet printing. So what we did was we, we crystallized a two to one benzo acid to isonicotinamide co-crystal from water as our reference material. And we used an inkjet printer to print a solution containing two to one by, by molar ratio benzo acid to isonicotinamide. And it precipitated some crystals. And then we analyze those crystals by DSC. I hope you can see that the DSC trace is rather complicated. In the circle, there is an endotherm followed by an exotherm. Then there's a really noisy bit of baseline and then it goes back to a normal baseline. The question is, what is happening to the two to one form during that DSC experiment? It's rather difficult to say, well, obviously it starts by melting. I think I think actually you could say it starts by melting, but after that, what is happening to the sample really difficult to, to understand. So we sent those samples to my friend at the University of Bradford, and he started by taking our two reference materials. That's a two to one co-crystal and a one to one co-crystal. And he ran reference uh, spectra in the Raman spectrometer. So those are shown on the screen in front of you. One to one is shown in red, two to one is shown in black. I think you can see if you look across those two spectra in the main, the peaks are quite similar because the material is essentially the same. It's just a small change in orientation of the molecules between uh, the two forms. But he identified around about 1000 centimeters to the minus one. He identified a clear difference in the spectral behavior of the two to one form and the one to one. That region is blown up in the top right hand side of the slide. And I hope you can see that at that particular wavelength, there is a doublet. So two peaks very close to each other. 
in the spectrum. And I also hope you can see that they are different between the two forms. In the one-to-one, -one, the peak on the right is bigger than the peak on the left. And in the two-to-one, -one, the peak on the left is bigger than the peak on uh, the right. And so what that means is you can use that particular doublet as an indicator of which physical form you have of your material. Is it the two-to-one form? Is it the one-to-one -one form? Remember that. So what he did was he went through the DSC data and he stopped the experiment at various temperatures and took a quick spectrum of the material as it sat in the pan. I've just picked a few representative examples that are on the slide. One's at 20 degrees, one's at 130 and one's at 150. If you go back and you look at the original DSC data, 20 degrees is at the start of the experiment, so it's your sort of baseline position, what the material was when it went in. 130 is just before that first endotherm, and 150 is between, after the first endotherm, in the middle of what else is going on. So 20 degrees shown in blue, 130 degrees shown in red, 150 degrees shown in black. Again, I've zoomed in on that region around, around, around about 1,000 centimetres to minus one. It's the region that's blown up on the top right-hand side. I hope you can see that uh, at 20 and 130, the peaks are the same. The peak on the left is bigger than the peak on the right. It's the two to one form. But when you get to 150, so the material, remember, has gone through an endotherm and then an exotherm, and then he's taken another spectrum. Now I hope you can see that the, the spectra have changed. And at 150, the peak on the right is bigger than the peak on the left. And so what that indicates is that the material started as the two to one co-crystal form. It melted, which is the endotherm. And when it crystallized, it then uh, crystallized to the one to one form. OK, it's kind of important. You might say to me, what's going on in the rest of that DSC trace? Why was it so noisy? And the answer is because it's the benzoic acids, two to one benzoic acid to isonicotinamide. When it recrystallizes to one to one benzoic acid and isonicotinamide, you have a lot of benzoic acid left over. Half of all of the benzoic acid in the sample is now not in the crystalline form anymore. And benzoic acid is a tricky molecule by DSC because it sublimes. So sublimation, remember, it goes straight to the gas from the solid phase. And so when that happens in a DSC, it causes quite a noisy baseline because the sample is being lost from the pan, but it tends to condense all over the inside of the instrument. And that, that's what happened in this case. So the first endotherm is melting of the two to one form. The exotherm is crystallizing to the one to one form. And then the noisy baseline is the sublimation of the excess um, benzoic acid. It would be quite difficult without this type of interpretation to say for absolute certain that's what was going on in the sample. But by making the measurement with a spectrometer, you can unequivocally say this is what is happening to the material. So we regularly send samples to my friend for this type of analysis. On the screen is another set of DSC data, in this case for glutaric acid. And to a first approximation, it looks pretty simple, doesn't it? There's a baseline period for a while, then around about 75 degrees, there's a melt, or at least it looks like there's a melt, it's an endotherm. And then around about 100 degrees, there's a second melt. Simples. What, is it simple, though? That's the question. In fact, the question is, to what? To what events should we assign these peaks? Because we started with glutaric acid. Why are there two peaks in, in what should otherwise be a pure sample? And we didn't know what to do with this set of data. So we asked ourselves the question, what is the gold standard for physical form analysis? It pains me to say it, but the gold standard is not DSC. DSC is great for determining what phases are there, but it's not great for identifying what those phases are. The gold standard is X-ray diffraction. So we thought, OK, what we'll do is we will try and make measurements with a powder X-ray diffractometer at various temperatures to try and understand what is going on with our material. Then we realise that some materials are relatively short lived. When you heat them up in a DSC and they change, in order to make an X-ray diffraction measurement on that sample, you've got to take it out of the DSC. You've got to go to the X-ray diffractometer, put the sample in. You need enough of it to actually make a pattern in the first place. And then when you use a benchtop instrument, it goes through all the different diffraction angles to build up the diffraction pattern. And that can take upwards of 30 minutes. And so it's a long time to make a measurement and you're trusting that your sample isn't changing in that time. OK, so we thought 
Well, that's good and everything, but is there a way of actually making a measurement, an X-ray diffraction measurement in situ, in real time, while the DSC is heating and cooling the sample? So I had this conversation with Gareth and we realized that if you go to a synchronous X-ray source, then you've got a chance of actually making this type of measurement for real. What is a synchronous X-ray source, I hear you ask? It's an X-ray source which is generated from a particle accelerator. So you've got a really big ring with electrons flying around and around it, and every now and again they're forced to go around a sharp corner, and as they go around that corner they have to slow down really suddenly, and they emit excess energy in the form of X-rays. And so you can get really high energy X-ray beams from a particle accelerator. The UK has a particle accelerator recently built. I think it was about 2007. It's called the Diamond Light Source, and it's based just outside of Oxford. On the screen in front of you is a photograph of the inside of the diamond synchrotron. The beam itself is on the left-hand side of that image, and it's a really big circle. And at various points on that circle, there are workstations where X-rays are taken off the ring and you can use them for scientific measurement. One of those workstations has an X-ray beam, which is really, really narrow. It's half a millimeter in diameter, but it's extremely high energy. And we realized that what you can do is take the DSC, you can mount it on the end of the workstation. And if you're really careful, you can get it so that the beam of X-rays, which is coming from the particle accelerator, passes straight through the instrument and the sample while the sample is being heated and cooled by the DSC. That's, that's the way we set up this experiment. So the photograph on the screen in front of you shows you the DSC head from my actual DSC instrument in the laboratory. The sample pan is on the left-hand side. The reference pan is on the right-hand side. The reference pan has a lid on. The sample pan does not, simply so we can show you that there's powder in there. But when we do the measurements for real, it has a, it has a lid on. Uh, and you can see two holes have been drilled in the DSC itself. Now, I've got to be honest, drilling holes in a £50,000 instrument is a little bit scary, and it does invalidate the warranty somewhat. So we asked TA Instruments, this is what we'd like to do. We'd like to take one of your DSC instruments, and we'd like to put it on the end of a particle accelerator, and we'd like to modify it so that the beam can go through the sample. And we'd like to do this so that we can measure X-ray patterns in real time as we heat and cool the sample. Would you be able to give us an instrument? And to our surprise, they said yes, which is very handy. So TA Instruments actually donated us this instrument, which meant we were allowed to drill holes in it, and we weren't actually damaging our own DSC, which is really good. And I've got to acknowledge TA Instruments for doing that because it was very good. So you can see two holes have been drilled in the head of the DSC, and the reason is because they are to allow the beam, the X-ray beam that comes from the synchrotron to pass through the sample. The aluminium pan that the sample is sitting in is quite thin, and the X-ray beam is quite powerful. And so it has no problem going through that aluminium pan. All it means is we get a few reflections from aluminium. But the actual instrument itself is quite thick. It's about half a centimeter thick aluminium and that would actually stop the x-ray beam so we had to drill those holes to allow the x-ray beam to pass through the sample that's one thing so then we mount the um, DSC itself on the stage in front of the particle accelerator that's shown on the screen in front of you and when we're ready to make a measurement the x-ray beam follows the path of the red arrow in this picture it passes through the sample and interacts with the sample and it's detected on the far side by a detector that is just a photograph of the instrument on the stage and that shows you it's pretty good. We can still have the lid of the furnace on. There's just a hole in the plastic casing again to allow the beam to pass through. What does this mean? It means that if we were to record a powder pattern in a laboratory, it takes around 30 minutes for each individual powder pattern. But because the beam coming off the synchrotron is such high power, we can record an individual pattern in just four seconds. Four seconds, that is amazingly quick. So the way that we set the instrument up is we record a powder pattern every four seconds, we have a two second pause, and then we record powder pattern again 
for four seconds, two second pause. So every six seconds, we're recording one powder pattern. The instrument, the DSC instrument, is set to record, uh, is set to increase in temperature, I should say, at uh, 10 degrees per minute. That's one degree every six seconds. So essentially, we end up with a data set, which is one powder pattern per degree centigrade as we heat the sample up or cool it down in the DSC. It's an absolutely amazing piece of technology. Uh, I highly recommend it, although if you want one at home, it's going to cost you several billion pounds to build the particle accelerator. And so that's, that's kind of not so useful. Now, what this means is when we finish one of these measurements, we have a lot of powder patterns. So imagine you've gone from room temperature, so for I can say 20 degrees centigrade, up to about 200 degrees centigrade at 10 degrees per minute. We're recording one powder pattern per degree centigrade. That's 180, de um, 180 powder patterns. So the question is, how should we interpret those powder patterns? One thing we could do is we could take the first powder pattern and then we could put the second one behind it and then the third one, then the fourth one and so on. And we could create this sort of three dimensional map of um, X-ray powder patterns as a function of temperature and look for changes. It, it is possible to do that, but it makes the data kind of difficult to um, analyze. So we do something uh, slightly different. So we convert the data to a heat map, essentially. And we've got to be careful with the word heat because we don't mean heat as in a, a DSC. So what we do is the X-ray data themselves are intensity as a function of angle, diffraction angle. And so we simply um, assign a number to that intensity and then we color code it. So the color code goes from um, black to white through the whole spectrum of colors. The higher the intensity, the lighter the color is getting. And so what that means is we just create a single strip for each diffraction pattern and each pixel represents a particular two theta angle and it will be color coded depending on how high the intensity is of the particular pattern. Then what we do is we, we rotate that round. So on this graph, <laughs> on the Y axis is two theta. So two theta on the diffraction pattern is on the X axis. And what we do is we look at the powder pattern. We put one pixel for each two theta angle and we color code it relative to how much the intensity is. And then we take that line and we rotate it through 90 degrees, plot it vertically. And that's um, diffraction pattern number one diffraction pattern number two, three, four, and we line them up in sequence. And we end up with a color map, a bit like the one that's shown on the screen in front of you. So on the Y axis is two theta angle, and then the color coding is going from dark to white, and it shows you the relative intensity as a function of two theta angle. The reason we plot these heat maps is because it's a lot easier to see visually when there is a change in the physical form of your material because while the material is not changing, every line that we stack on top of each other has the same basic pattern. And so you get these vertical lines, which represent the main peaks in your material's powder pattern. So you can see on the left-hand side of this graph, some really strong white lines, which are the main peaks for the material at those particular temperatures. When the material goes through a change in phase to a different polymorphic form, for instance, then the characteristic patterns are going to change. And so those white lines, which are the characteristic peaks, also move. And it's quite clear to see from the data in front of you where the materials change physical form. And I've highlighted it with the black dotted lines. So left hand side, the material is in one form. In the middle, it switched to a different form. And on the right, you've lost all the forms because the material has melted. So the way that we interpret these is we then correct the, y, uh, the x axis for temperature and we overlay the heat map on top of the DSC data. So if you look at the screen in front of you, on the bottom is the DSC trace for glutaric acid and above it is the heat map, which we managed to record from the x-ray diffraction data and they have the same x axis. So the temperature scales are the same. Now I hope you can see that when we put the black lines on the heat map, the black lines correspond to the changes we see in the DSC trace. And we can say unequivocally, when we started heating this up, glutaric acid, it was in the beta form. Everything on the left-hand side, the baseline of the DSC, the material is in the beta form. That first peak, the smaller of the two peaks, the small endotherm, corresponds with a change in physical form from beta to alpha. Kind of important that the material did not melt. If you look at the heat map from the X-ray diffractometer, 
you'll see there was never an amorphous phase. The material never melted. It went from beta to alpha, just like that. And then it remained in the alpha phase. And then the second endotherm is a melt. It's the melt of the alpha phase. So we would have misinterpreted those data, I think, if we didn't have the x-ray data. We'd have said the material's got two forms and they both melt. But the reality is it was in one form. When you get to a certain temperature, there's a solid, solid transition. It's called solid, solid because it never melts. It goes from beta to alpha and then the alpha melts. The reason it does that is because glutaric acid is an example of an enantiotropic polymorph. It's quite difficult to say, isn't it? So it's enantiotropic polymorphism. If you remember what that means, it means that at one particular temperature, one form is the stable form. So in this case, below that critical temperature, which is about 80 degrees, the beta form is the stable form. Above 80 degrees, the alpha form is now the stable form and the material crystallizes to the alpha form. And then the alpha form melts at around 105 degrees centigrade. We would not have been able to interpret that without the DSC trace. One really cool thing that you can do is by selecting specific um, two theta angles, two theta angles which are specific for in individual physical forms. You can then plot the intensity of those peaks as a function of temperature, which is shown on the screen in front of you. And what you'll see is that you lose one of the forms and you gain the other ones. In this case, we can see the loss of beta and the creation of alpha, which is kind of cool. So that's it for the lecture. I just wanted to give you an example of how we use um, DSC and we combine it with other things, in particular the X-ray diffractometer. We, we tend to go and do that at least once a year up at the synchrotron, which is kind of cool. And we have loads of papers with different examples of what we've studied by DSC and X-ray diffraction. So when we have our live workshop um, in a week or so's time, we're going to give you some of the papers that we've published based on um, DSC and X-ray diffraction. And you're going to have a look at some of the examples. But the take home from this um, lecture, at least, is DVS means measuring the mass of a sample as a function of relative humidity or possibly relative vapor pressure. If you're using ethanol, you really can't tell too much about your material other than how it absorbs um, water. But if your material is amorphous, there's probably going to be a critical relative humidity at which it becomes unstable. And so you can use the measurement to determine what that critical humidity is. And that allows you to set your storage conditions. If you want to get more information from your experiment, you really need to link it to something else, usually a form of spectroscopy. We link to NIR because NIR is really useful for following water. And water is usually what's interacting with your sample in a DVS. So that's that. And then we looked at another um, couple of examples where we link the DSC to something um, one example is we link it to Raman spectroscopy and we've also linked it to powder X-ray diffraction. Right. So with that, we're done. Have a squeeze through the data. See if you understand. If you don't, fire me a question. Otherwise, I'll see you soon.